Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Nicholas Johnson. I am an associate professor of musicology at Butler University and I've had the pleasure of being the program note writer for several years for the Ensemble Music Society. I also do a project with Classical Music Indie called Classical Pairings in which I talk about some local music, some can canonic music, all sorts of different classical music and I mix it with cocktails and beer and have all sorts of fun with that. Um, but I'm here today to talk to you about the May Music Festival that the Ensemble Music Society is putting on. Now, one of the things that I've always loved about working with the Ensemble Music Society is that they mix um, the traditional classics in the genre of chamber music, the classic string quartets, piano trios, that sort of thing, with some newer, especially 20th and even 21st century compositions. They do a really good job of mixing the old with the new, and this festival is no exception. We have three fantastic works by Beethoven, some of his uh, mid-period works and then one of his most important late works. But we also have two American composers from after 1980 that we're going to have in this series. And so I'm going to be doing two lectures for the Ensemble Music Society for this week. This lecture I'm going to be talking about the work by Morton Feldman, a very exciting but also challenging work, and I hope that I'm going to help uh, illuminate the significance of this, con this concert. I'm then going to give another lecture where I talk about the Beethoven works and then one by Ellen's Village, a very exciting, one of the most important um, American and female composers. Um, so you can check that video out um, on the same page. So, but this lecture we're going to be talking about Morton Feldman and specifically his piece Trio for Violin, Cello, and Piano from 1980. Now I understand if you are a fan of chamber music, you might not be as familiar with Morton Feldman. And you will probably see the name of Beethoven and you know you're gonna have a, a wonderful time at that concert or tuning in for the live stream. But I'm here to tell you that this Morton Feldman concert, it's the one that I'm the most excited about. And that's because these sorts of live events, this has not happened often. I've actually never seen this work by Morton Feldman or hardly any other work by Morton Feldman performed live. And that's not because it's not great music, it's because it's challenging music for both the audience and especially for the performers, as we're gonna hear. But the Horse of Its Trio, um, they do a fantastic job with this work and I'm very excited to hear their performance. So my goal in this talk is if you are thinking about maybe picking up a ticket for this concert, um, I'm hoping that I can get you to really think critically about if this is a concert that you can afford to miss or not. Um, and if you already have your ticket, and I hope you do, I have mine, I hope I'm going to give you some information that will kind of help illuminate the concert, make it a more enjoyable, more informative, and a more educational experience. And in the end, hopefully more enriching. So let's go ahead and dive into the music of Morton Feldman. So Morton Feldman was born in Queens, New York, um, of American Jewish immigrants. And in the program notes for this concert, I, I break down this piece in sort of four different ways because this concert is taking up, it, it's the entire evening. The piece is about an hour and a half long. Um, and so I decided to, in my notes, go a little more in depth than I sometimes do. So I'm gonna talk about his biography in the notes. I talk about um, his relationship with the visual arts. I talked about his relationship with postmodernism in the 20th century. And then I talked some about this piece specifically. I'm going to kind of do a similar thing here, but I'll be talking about some different ideas. I'm going to be showing some imagery here in a minute. Um, and if you put these two together, I hope that you end up with sort of a more um, enriching experience for the concert. So, as I said, Feldman is born in New York, and he becomes friends with a very important composer, John Cage, in the 1950s. Now, of all the American avant-garde composers, John Cage is the one that people have probably heard of the most, though honestly, probably not for one of his actual composer music that you would hear before his composition, four minutes and 33 seconds, which is the piece that the entire three movements of the piece take place in total silence. Um, and that piece has become um, somewhat, of a, somewhat of a joke, but also, you know, a commentary on music and uh, culture. And we're not really going to get into that piece today, but Feldman is writing in that same sort of artistic environment. And that's important for us to keep in mind um, when we're approaching his music. Um, and also, with Cage, Feldman was very good friends with several abstract artists that probably you have heard of, like Jackson Pollock or Mark Rothko, both of whom I'm going to be talking about in a few more minutes. Um, those, all of these, the sort of New York avant-garde scene of the 1950s that continued for several decades, um, sort of informs the way that we can understand Feldman's music. And really, all of these artists searching for 
new methods to communicate meaning or truth or lack thereof, <laughs> lack of meaning and lack of truth, which is itself a type of meaning, but we'll, we'll get there in, in just a little bit. Um, Feldman uh, spent several decades in New York working on this music. He eventually was a professor at the University of Buffalo. Um, the work that we're gonna be listening to is relatively late uh, in his career. His earlier music um, focuses a lot on graphic scores. Um, I'm gonna show a couple images. I'm gonna put some in um, for you to look at, just a couple images of his music from the 50s or 60s, which are these very sort of experimental um, scores that imply a great deal of chance and they leave up a lot to the performer. They might tell them, the score might inform them, play notes here, but what, what are those notes? It, it's up to the performers. They might, he might imply the timbre, he might imply the dynamic, or maybe he gives a note, but gives no length for how long to play the note or at what rhythm. And so a lot of Feldman's music from the 50s and 60s, like John Cage, relies on chance and relies on the performer to input a lot of the information. It allows sort of an improvisational spirit. Now the work we're gonna be listening to from 1980 is, is very different than that. Feldman, rather than leaving it up to chance, gets very precise with his musical language in this work. Um, and we'll, we'll look at that composition here in just a little bit. Let's think a little bit more though. It, it will help inform all of this to think about Feldman and the visual arts. There are really two painters that I think are gonna help us to understand this composition. Um, that's Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko. You have probably seen images of their paintings before, or if you've been fortunate you've, enough, you've actually seen them in real life. Um, it, it's somewhat ironic that unlike the com avant-garde composers of the time, the avant-garde painters of the time are now valued at you know, millions and billions of dollars for some of these works. Um, but they're all created in the same artistic atmosphere. So if you enjoy painting by Pollock or by Rothko, I think you're really gonna like this work. You just sort of have to reframe how you listen to it. You can't listen to a Feldman the way you listen to a Beethoven because it's a completely different language. In the same way, you can't look at a Rothko and think of it in the same way that you would look at a Renaissance painting because they're communicating in different ways. So Jackson Pollock, um, you've probably seen his abstract painting, his experimental works um, from the 1940s and 50s. Um, there's a few ways that he was very influential to his friend, Morton Feldman. Um, Pollock did a lot of his work um, not on a traditional easel that he was painting, but he would often stand over a ca uh, his canvas and often very large canvases. He would move them around, they'd be at different angles. He would drip paint on them and allow the paint to sort of flow naturally where it wanted. Um, I'm showing here number 1A from 1948. And look at the way that the paint drips sort of ripple and roll across the canvas. What this is, a way to think of this, is an action painting. What you are, it's almost as if this moment in time is frozen. He's not showing you a picture, right? He's not painting a picture of, of, of flowers. He is instead showing you paint in motion. I'm now showing you number 31 from 1950. And so this is, in some ways, it's a rec, it's sort of like a record of, of almost the, the fluidness of paint rather than some sort of an image. And so here, um, we, you know, postmodern artists, we'll talk about postmodernism here in just a minute, but in some ways they're, they're redefining how do you create meaning. And just like composers were experimenting with all sorts of different sounds, what is a consonant? What is a harmony? What should an instrument sound like? They start to bend all of those rules. Here Pollock is bending the rules of painting and he's letting the paint paint, if that makes sense. And in some ways Feldman is going to let the performers compose in the sense that rather than telling them exactly what they should do, he is going to give them various ideas. Now, again, in the work we're gonna be listening to, he's far more specific. But that sort of keeping that in mind, the sort of letting the paint paint on the canvas, Feldman has the idea of basically treating his score, and he, he literally says this, as a time canvas. And he is thinking about, um, whereas a Pollock, or they're often very large uh, paintings, Rothko, were, I'm sorry, Feldman works are often very large in the sense of a time canvas, that they're very long and a lot of things happen. And he lets the music, music, if you will. Um, 
my students might have chuckled at that line. But, but I actually think there is some meaning in that, of letting the music be the music. Let it write itself in a way. Um, we'll, we'll break that, I that idea down just a little bit more. Um, the other painter that I mentioned was Mark Rothko, also in the same circle, also, also friends with Feldman. You have probably seen some of his images. Um, I'm showing here number five slash number 22. This is from 1950. Um, these floating zones of color over other sort of colored grounds. Um, these blocks of color, they very rarely reach the, the, the edge of the canvas. Instead, it's supposed to appear as if they are floating. Often these works are either monochromatic, like the one I'm showing you, or very sort of a, a colors that contrast quite a bit. Now at first, these paintings might seem, okay, what's, what's the point? What am I supposed to be seeing here? I'm looking at a yellow and then a slightly different yellow and an orange. And I don't understand what's, what's happening. But the key to this, paint these paintings, is to spend time with them. And obviously this works better if you can see them in, in real life, but spend time with the painting, allow your eyes to adjust to one of the colors, and then shift your gaze up the painting, and the color that you're looking at is now different. Because your eye is sort of blending these shades together, and you end up with where even the color is not static because the colors inform the neighboring colors. So a bright yellow band with an orange band, if you are looking at them together, they inform each other and how you sort of read the colors. And so the, the significance here, one could say, is that um, one, of the, one of the big issues of postmodernism, which we'll break down a little bit more detail in here in just a minute, is that all elements of truth are open to question. And here, color itself is open to question. This is a big yellow rectangle but its meaning changes based on the colors that are next to it. And as your eye starts to adjust, you start to see different shades. And the, the painting almost sort of, uh, people have described Rothko's works as sort of breathing and vibrating as these, uh, as these different color palettes are competing sort of for attention with your eyes. And what we're gonna talk, uh, with, with Feldman's works, that's gonna start to happen. In some ways, you're going to hear a musical fragment um, a musical gesture is the phrase we'll be using here in just a minute. A short idea, um, some sort of noise, and you do it six times, or maybe 12, or maybe three. And then you have another musical idea, a short new gesture. Well, that gesture, the way you hear it, is informed by the gesture you just heard. And so this, this block of sound colors, you know, orally, this block of sound, which colors this block of sound. And just like you might spend an hour looking at a Rothko and experiencing this a very sort of slow shift of color meaning, the same thing happens in a work by Feldman, where you experience a slow shift in sound meaning. And, and honestly, this is always going to be better if you can experience this in a live concert, because I mean, the best recording equipment in the world with the best speakers is never going to match acoustic instruments in a concert hall. And so if you are um, safe and healthy and able to attend this live, I think you'll even have a more enriching experience, but it will still be a beautiful experience even live streaming it um, at home because you're still going to experience this subtle shift in sound meaning like you might in a Rothko of a subtle shift in color meaning. Okay, I've been talking about postmodernism a lot. I'm gonna break this down a little bit um, in a way that I, I hope is going to inform even deeper, and then we're gonna get into Feldman's music specifically. Postmodernism is a philosophical and artistic viewpoint um, that is basically impossible to sum up in about a three minute lecture, uh, I'm sorry, in a three minute clip of this, you know, 20-ish minute lecture, but I'm gonna do my best here. Um, it's it is postmodernism, as the name implies, is a challenge to modernism. So we need to quickly define that, and then we can define how postmodernism fits. Modernism is a philosophy and artistic stance, largely from the early 20th century, that um, fundamentally, if we, are, if we are concerned with issues of truth, modernism proposes that there is answers and truth that we can eventually discover through either extremely specific, so for in art, for example, through extremely specific serialist techniques, or even more broadly in philosophy and science, the, the idea that eventually if we keep progressing as a society, we are going to achieve some sort of a collective agreement of truth. 
Postmodernism says, no. <laughs> Basically, that cannot happen. That because all experience and all belief is relative, and that everything that we believe is shaped by our upbringing, our genetics, our friend groups, our family, our health, all sorts of different things, influence in some way our perception of truth and meaning. And so a good deal of postmodernism is questioning what is truth, what is meaning, is there, is there truth, is this a thing that we can ever all actually agree on? As, as Einstein proved, even mathematics is relative um, to various forces in the universe. And so in postmodern art and in music and in theater and literature and, and drama, um, artists are questioning the fabric of the object itself because they are saying there is no meaning, there is no truth, but there is explorations of emotion, there's explorations of um, the medium itself, so like Pollock exploring the medium of paint itself, letting the paint paint, um, like composers like Cage exploring what is music. Maybe it's sitting in a concert hall and listening to the sounds around you as people shuffle uncomfortably while nothing is happening on stage. Maybe that's the music, right? Um, and so when you're listening to postmodern art, it's you, you are supposed to kind of allow your mind um, if you're listening to postmodern music, I should say, allow your mind to open up to, well, maybe my pre preconceived notion of what is, is true isn't really accurate. And maybe I should open my mind up to a different sound experience. Um, and so often in postmodern music, the, the first sort of wave of postmodernism was very interested in exploring new timbres. We've been listening to beautiful violins, for, for example, for centuries. These beautiful virtuosic players that can go super lyric or super virtuosic. Well, in the postmodern movement, why don't we have them do weird stuff to the violin? Let's question what is a violin. Let's have them do all sorts of weird pluckings. Let's have them scream into the instrument. There's all sorts of things you can do to change the instrument itself. Um, and you could do that to a composition. Rather than four traditional movements of a string quartet, why don't we have one very long movement where we slowly explore one musical idea? Um, and so understanding that that's kind of what's happening in, in a lot of late 20th century music, and in some ways we're still in the postmodern movement, though we might be in the post-postmodern movement, which is um, an annoying conversation to have, and so we'll kind of skip over that. But the, um, I, I think it will help that as if we think about you know, how how fast life is changing right now, how fast technology is changing right now, how the life that we live right now is completely different than the one 10 years ago. In the sense, a lot of things are very similar, but the fact that you can now live stream this concert, for example, and the fact that basically anybody that has the technology now because of the pandemic has the means to do that. And so the things that we believe to be fundamentally true can shift. And the ground is sort of always shifting under us and the art is reflecting that and commenting on that. And perhaps even, as I'm gonna argue with the Feldman here in just a minute, finding beauty in that shifting, trying to find meaning and peace with the shifting. Um, uh, Cage, for example, would talk about how he would just listen to traffic and find the beauty in the music of traffic, which is, you know, in a way laughable. It's like, okay, John Cage, we get it. Um, but. Also, think about how many times you've been stuck in traffic. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just roll down your window and listen to traffic and think that it's a beautiful symphony? Wouldn't it, in a, in a way, make your life more pleasant? And so maybe there's something about opening ourselves up to these sort of um, odd explorations um, in, in music. So with Feldman, postmodernism sort of boils itself down into a, a few kind of tenets um, or a few key principles that appear in a lot of his compositions. First of all, Feldman enjoys very low volume levels um, in a lot of his pieces, including the work we're going to hear. And that is partially because he wants you to really be able to investigate the sound at this low volume that you're not like you can sort of, it's a low, slow volume that you can sort of pay attention to all of it. So not one instrument being much louder than another, but all instruments sort of presented equally at this low volume. Um, he also, another tenant is he has sort of austere textures, but what I mean by that is it's often very thin. There's, a, there's gonna be a couple things happening at once and that's it. We're not getting a big 
um, heroic symphony here, or even a Beethoven late symphony where there's so many layers and complexity and depth. And that music for it, uh, is still completely beautiful and in its time was especially beautiful as a communication of the belief system of the time. But here, by breaking it down to this very thin texture, you can analyze it from multiple angles and, and sort of, as I said earlier, let the music music, if you will. Another um, sort of tenant is rhythm in Feldman's music is often very complex and shifting, either through improvisation on the point of view of the performer, or in the case of the work we're listening to, extremely detailed and specific rhythms, as the time signatures are constantly changing, because he doesn't want there to be a pulse or a beat. There will occasionally be a little bit of a beat. You'll, you'll occasionally get a repetition that will be in time, and all of a sudden you will lock into it in this disorienting way, and, and it's like, oh, this is nice, and then it's gone. <laughs> And then you hear something different that's in a completely different sort of time signature. And again, it's gesture communicating to gesture here, like we were talking about earlier. Along with that, another tenant is minimalist repetition, meaning we're gonna have a short phrase that we do multiple times. And again, this is allowing us the chance to observe it by itself, compare it to copies of itself, and compare it to the gestures around it. Just like in a Rothko painting, this one band of color, we compare it slowly over time with the colors above it and below it. Uh, Roth, uh, next, uh, Feldman tends to write music of very long length. Um, he has a six hour string quartet of one movement, um, just like an abstract painter might have a gigantic canvas. Uh, this work is about an hour and a half, but it is also only one movement without a break, and it is, um, to be honest, sort of grueling in terms of concentration, excuse me, for the performer. And then finally, a last tenet, and this is sort of more just a general way to think about it, is you can almost view the composition from inside the composition. You are, it's almost like you're in the score looking out at the various ideas and sketches that can become a piece of music. Okay, so in this trio, there, it, it is sort of a difficult composition for us to, to break down because there's not a, tr a, a traditional structure. In a Beethoven uh, string quartet, I might talk about the four movements and I might break down in a sonato form. We have an exposition that leads to development to a recapitulation. We don't have anything like that. We have, just like a Pollock painting that is filling it with gestures of drips of paint, we have this entire time canvas filled with gestures and ideas that communicate with each other. So as you are listening to this work, um, there are a few ways in which the meaning is being com communicated. And I break this down in a little more detail in the program notes, but I'll go through a couple of them here. First of all, we are not going to be listening to this piece for traditional melodies. You are not going to walk away humming a nice, beautiful tune. Instead, you are going to hear short melodic gestures that are going to communicate with each other, meaning um, one of the things that Feldman is very interested in is musical pattern. And what he's going to do is take this gesture and then repeat it, and then repeat it again, slightly changed, and then repeat it again, slightly changed, in this pattern that goes. But specifically, Feldman is interested in patterns that are not a perfect match. So in some ways, he is going to be playing with your expectations. He's going to present a pattern, and then he's going to break it, basically. Um, and so he's giving you a little bit of comfort and then he's taking it back away. But that experience is, is in a way, the composition itself. Like the, what is happening in your head as you are listening is in some ways the meaning of this work. Likewise, the work is, it's mostly fairly dissonant, although because, as I said earlier, it's at a loud, I'm sorry, a very low volume, it's not sort of a painful dissonance like you might hear in some 20th century composers. Instead, because it is so soft, you can almost... It's almost like a delicate, dissonant object that you can actually look at with a little bit of distance and think about in a different way. Um, the form of this piece, I've already said there's no overarching form, and in fact, it helps to think of this piece as uh, at the micro level rather than at a more macro level. Um, in the next lecture, I'm gonna be talking about uh, a Beethoven string quartet that you think about, you, that we can, it really helps to think about at the macro level. Here, we're thinking about it gesture to gesture, idea to idea, not one, there's no arch form, there's nothing like that. There's no big modulations where, where we're leaving point A to get to point B. We are never at a point, <laughs> basically. Or we're at just a bunch of tiny little pointillist points, almost. Um, the piece is one thing, sort of a final thing I'll leave, I'll leave you with. This piece is 
really as grueling and difficult as some of the most virtuosic string quartets or piano trios in this case that, that you might hear. But it's a work that is grueling in its attention to detail. Um, it's going to sound at times like the performers are improvising. I can promise they're not. What they're doing is reading constantly shifting, very difficult meters and pitches that they're having to unify as an ensemble in ways that in other works is not common at all. It's a very difficult work to perform and they do it for an hour and a half. Um, but faithful performance to this music, you know, relate sort of an experience of, of almost euphoria where you get sort of lost, like you're living in that Pollock painting for a little bit where meaning itself sort of disappears for a while and it creates this different sort of auditory experience. So I hope um, this talk has at least been informative for you as you were thinking about hearing this sort of composition. If you're, if you're still on the fence about getting a ticket, I'll just say that this sort of concert doesn't happen often. So get the ticket, have the experience, enjoy this piece of art. Um, you're not gonna enjoy it in the way that you would maybe enjoy a Mozart symphony. I'll just be perfectly honest but it's going to be a completely different experience. You're going to, like, as you're listening, I want you to pay attention to your response to it. So you're hearing these gestures and these patterns that defy themselves. Why is that making you uneasy? If, if it makes you uneasy. Um, or why do you find joy in that? In some ways, these works can become so sort of introspective of why do I like this or why don't I? In the same way you could look at a Pollock and why do, why do I love this Pollock and my best friend hates this Pollock? Both of those are completely reasonable responses. The question is why? And what about you resonates with that? And so in some ways, these works can be a way for us to learn more about ourselves, which I think is really quite fascinating in postmodern art like this. So I hope you have enjoyed this talk. You can, I think you can make some comments um, with some questions or you can come to the concert and talk to me about it um, from a socially safe distance, of course. Um, I will be back with another talk about Zvillich and Beethoven. So thank you so much. Goodbye.